how to double your church, your business, and your personal productivity. That's quite a statement, isn't it? To have a title that uh, you suggest that we can learn to double a church in a relatively short period of time. Not to grow 5% or 10% or to hold its own, but actually double your church. Or how can you double your business so that you yourself, if you run a business or are involved in a business, what are the secrets that could bring about a major shift in your own company and to double? I'm looking forward to sharing these principles with you. They're going to be challenging to you. There are going to be ideas that you probably haven't thought of before. And they're going to stretch the boundaries of your thinking. But people who understand the secrets and then use those secrets can experience remarkable change. I'm going to uh, talk about a principle or a law for a minute. If I, if I took my pen and if I let go of it, which direction would it go? It would go down. If I gave it to you and you let it go, which direction would it go? It would go down. If I went in the middle of the jungle somewhere to somebody who's never heard of gravity and said to them, uh, here, here is my pen, would you please let it go? Which direction would it go? Those principles that are installed in the earth by God exist above personality. They exist above training. They exist whether or not you've gone to school or not. Whether you've gone past grade three or a college graduate. If you know the law, you can use the law to your benefit. If you do not know the law, even if you are educated, then you do not know how to grow your organization. And what we're going to do is to share with you today those laws which govern rapid growth. I was talking to um, an individual who said, you know, I have a friend and everywhere he goes to be the pastor, within 18 months he splits the church. He said he has mastered the law of church splitting. <laughs> well, he has. And I'm sure in his mind he was blaming the people in those churches for the church splits. He never really understood, no, it was my pen, and I'm the leader, and I, and I let it go, and I follow a pattern, and that pattern brings about a church split. There are other people that are friends of mine that wherever they go, whatever church they go to, the church just takes right off. And it's not their personality, because I know many people who have varying personalities, who have the secrets inside of them, and they know how to use them. If I were to come to you and say, okay, I'm going to give you the mic, and I want you to tell me the top three principles or secrets how, how I, as a pastor, could double my church in, let's say, a year. What would you say? What would you tell me to do? It's interesting. Some people would say, the biggest secret is to pray. And I would say, prayer definitely is a powerful thing, but it doesn't double churches. Because I know many churches that pray regularly, and the attendance is declining. Prayer doesn't necessarily double the church. What, what then are the secrets that you would say is how to double a church? Or if we were to divide this and say, let's talk about business for a minute. How could you as an individual double your business at the revenue that you have this year, a year from today? Well, those are the topics I want to talk to you about. And to start off, I want to start kind of below the church and below the business just about you as a person. And I want to talk to you about you for a minute. And I want to talk about, can, can you as an individual double your personal productivity? These are organizations, a church or a business. But those are led by individuals. And you are the key to these things growing and doubling. And I want to talk to you as an individual first. And I want to talk to you about something on the inside, a motive or a reason why a person would seek to double something or to grow something. Because this day is not about quality. It's not about how to disciple people. It's not how to mature people. 
It really is, how do you double something? How do you grow it from this size to this size? Or how do you grow it from this size to this size? Because there are secrets that govern that. But the most basic secret is inside of you and what you're motivated to do, how much you're seeking to excel in this area. And I want you to take a look at your workbook because I want to talk about your personal productivity in the next two sessions. Session number one is the reason to maximize your personal productivity. And session number two is the reason to maximize your productivity until payday. That's going to be a shocker. You're going to learn some things that very few people have seen in Scripture, even though they're in black and white. Our first session is the reason to maximize your personal productivity. And I'm going to take you to a passage that has changed my life a lot. It's the parable of the minas in the Gospel of Luke. And I want you to take a look on part number one where it says, Jesus reveals the reason to multiply your personal productivity. Meaning, if I were to come to you and ask you, what's the reason a person would want to double their church? What's the reason a person would want to double their business? What's the reason you would like to do twice as much in these next 12 months as you're doing right now? How would you answer that question? What would be the motivation for you in that? I want you to turn to the person next to you and ask them the question, what would be your motive of why you want to learn how to double a church or your business? So turn to the person next to you, ask them that question, what would be the reason you would do that? Well, what kind of answers did you get? Because I need more income? Because I love Christ? Because that's what I would like to do? What, what's the real reason? If I were to ask Jesus that question, hold on to this now. <laughs> if Jesus were here and I were to walk over to him and say to him, Jesus, what, why would you want me to do that? What do you think he, his answer would be? I think it's going to be shocking to you. I, I know it is. His answer is not what we expect. And I want to bring this out of a parable. And the parable is in Luke chapter 19. And I have some fill-ins I want you to follow with me as we quickly go through it. Number one, under part number one, is the setting of the parable of the minas. The setting. Here's the setting. It's in verse number 11. Now, as they heard these things, that's the disciples, they're talking with Jesus. He spoke another parable. So Jesus is going to make up a story. A parable is a story that he makes up. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So here's what's taking place. The disciples are coming down from the north. And on the way down to Jerusalem, they're arguing about who's going to sit on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus when the, when the big war happens. And when Jesus sits on the throne of his father David and rules and overthrows the Romans and all the Gentiles brings the wealth to Jerusalem and all the promises that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph take place. And they're arguing about who's going to sit on the right and the left hand. Do you know why they were arguing? Because they expected when Jesus got to Jerusalem, that's what he was going to do. It was the time. It was the feast in Israel that they expected the Messiah to come and achieve that. And Christ knew, and he had told his best friends repeatedly, that I am going to die. And I'm not going to set up my physical kingdom now. I'm going to set up a spiritual kingdom now. But the Bible says, even in the chapter before this, in Luke 18, that God hid the fact from the disciples even when Jesus told them. He told them. They heard it, but it didn't register in them. That's why they were still arguing about, I want to rule, I want to reign, I want to sit in your right and left hand. But Jesus knew that he was going to leave. So he invents a story to carry a point. Because he knew, I'm going to die, 
I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to heaven. I'll be in heaven for a long period of time. And then I'm coming back the second time and I'm going to rule and reign on the earth at that point. And he knew he was going to be gone. And he knew that he had trained his disciples all over here and they worked with him while he was here. But they would be wondering, what am I supposed to do when you're gone? What am I supposed to do? And so Jesus makes up a fictional story to answer the question, here's what you're supposed to do. And believe it or not, we're still living in the same period of time between the first and second coming. And this parable, though it was given to the disciples, is really for you and me today. And it answers the question, not only what am I supposed to do between the first and the second comings of Jesus, but what's going to happen to me depending upon how I live my life, how I produce for Christ. Because Jesus was very clear, I want you to seek my kingdom first. Put me in front of everything that you do. Put all of your life upon serving me and building my kingdom and my church and bringing love and hope into the community that you live. But Jesus is going to reveal something that is shocking. And it's a motivation that's missing in the church today. But it's Christ's motivation. So what is therefore the setting of the parable? The setting is Christ is going to leave. His disciples don't know that, even though he's told them repeatedly because God hid it from them. And Christ answers the question of what you're supposed to do. And he makes up a parable. A parable is a story usually made up like that on the spot. None of the people we're going to read about are actual people. They're people that he invented. And Jesus made up stories more than any other method of teaching he used. When's the last time you did that? You actually made up a story. It's a fiction to carry a point. Fiction is the most powerful way. That's why the most purchased books in the world are fictions. They're made up stories. And Jesus does that. Now, here's what takes place. Point number two is the command to do business until he returns. The command to do business until he returns. Therefore, the Bible says, he said, a certain nobleman, which turns out to be Jesus, went into the far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So that's the second coming. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, which is an amount of money, and said to them, I want you to do business, now watch this, until I come. So here's what's taking place. A business owner is leaving on a long and extended trip. He has his cash, and he wants the people who work for him to multiply the cash. And he gives everybody the same amount. He gives them a mina. It's a hunk of money. Unlike the parable of the talents and pounds, which is according to your ability, five and two and one, everybody here gets the same. And in this parable, we're all the same. We each have a mina. Now, obviously, Jesus doesn't give a hunk of money to each of his 12 people. So he's using the mina to represent, I want you to serve me with your life which is your time and your talents and your opportunities. And I want you to multiply my kingdom through your life. But he uses something tangible, a concrete mina. And he says to them, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, and here's what I want you to do. While I'm gone, that's where we live today. It's called the church age. And before I come back, I want you to take my mina, your life, and I want you to grow it as fast as you can. That's called productivity. I'm the boss. I'm giving you this command. It's actually imperative. I command you to do business till I come. And then Jesus leaves. Remember, the story's answering the question, what am I supposed to do between the first and the second coming? Do business, my business, with your life until I come back again. Well, what takes place next is Christ talked to the people that are nearby that didn't want to be his servants. And that's the third part, the rejection of the master, the rejection of the master and his reign by the citizens. 
Christ then turns to the other people around and says to them, but his citizens, the other people that were listening to the parable, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not, listen to those words, that's rebellion. We will not have this man to reign over us. They knew that Jesus was a king, but they didn't want that person to reign over them. And then Jesus skips them. And I'm sure there were people who were hearing this parable thinking, oh man, I'm one of those people. I don't want him to reign over me. Now, what does Jesus want between the first and second coming? He wants you to do business. Do business. It's not that he says, I will do business. It's you do business. You do business while I'm gone. Okay. Number four is the evaluation of the productivity of his servants. The evaluation of the productivity of his servants. So it was when he returned. That's Christ. When he comes back again, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know, watch these words, how much? That's called being productive. How much what? Every man had gained by trading. So what does he want to do? He says, here's my command to you. I'm leaving. I'm going to get a kingdom. I'm coming back again. While I'm gone, I'm giving you a command, my command. You do business till I come back. You do business as best as you can. I'm not giving you a mina to keep it a mina. How many minas are you going to make for me? Because it's my mina. It's my kingdom. It's not your kingdom. But are you going to build my kingdom while I'm gone? Well, that's a big question. So he calls him back to find out, this is called accountability, for your productivity. Do you realize that um, you will stand before Jesus to give an account of your productivity? You don't give an account of your faith in Christ. That's a gift called salvation. You give an account of what you did for him. That's what you did with the mina. So let's take a look at then the people that Christ includes in his story. Point number five is my favorite, the 10 mina servant, his productivity and his reward. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. Christ responds to him rather remarkably. He says to him, number one, well done. Why does he say well done? Anybody that can grow something 10 times. This is not doubling. This is taking, this is taking one and making it into two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This isn't doubling. Doubling is taking one and making two. This is an amazing achievement. And what Christ says to his servant is, wow, well done. That's a job, listen to it carefully, that has to do with quantity. I gave you one. You worked hard and smart. Listen to that. You worked hard and smart, and you grew it ten times. So let's say, for instance, in this conversation, you are a pastor of a church. If you were a 10 mina man and you had a church of 60 people, a 10 mina man would say, now you have a church of 600 people. That's significant. Well done. And what I was taught erroneously is God doesn't care about numbers. All he cares about quality. That's heresy. God cares about quality, and God cares about quantity. In fact, listen to this sentence by Jesus. By this, said Jesus, my Father, my Father is glorified. By this, in John 15, my Father is glorified. Well, what is it that glorifies the Father? That you bear much fruit. The fruit is a good work. It's not necessarily leading a person to Christ. It's something you do that heaven wants done. But I want you to understand Christ is all about quantity. 
By this, my Father's glorified that you bear much. If I bear little, I don't glorify God. I may glorify God in a song service, but that's not what Christ is talking about. It is, what did you do with you? What did you do with you? Because 80% of all the churches and 80% of all the businesses in the world have plateaued. Or they're going down a little bit. There's no productivity. There's activity. We work, but there's no productivity. So that's what we're talking about. That is your personal productivity. And I'm trying to answer a very challenging question. That is, why should I do this? And what Christ is going to do here is he's going to reveal his reason, not mine or yours, why. And when you come to grips with it, it can change your life rather radically. So he says, back to that passage, he says, well done. And then he says, good servant. Why does he say good servant? Because the servant was commanded by Christ. I command you, imperative, you do business. And don't do a little bit of business. Do a lot of business while I'm gone. That's a good servant who does what you say. Then he says something that's shocking. Because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. This is remarkable. He is, he is linking something. I'm going to use this to represent the second coming of Christ when he sits on the throne in Jerusalem. I read the book of Isaiah yesterday. This talks all about this. When he comes back and sits on the throne, in a sense, you, you have to understand he rules the world here. He rules the world. And he calls his servants together, and he says to them, tell me what you've done for me. And this one says, I took one and made ten. Well, what Jesus then says, you did exactly what I wanted. You really grew my kingdom through you. You proved, hold on to this, you proved yourself faithful to me. What do I, what do I mean faithful? I mean, I told you to get after it. I gave you your life. What did you make from it for me? Because you grew from one to ten, then Jesus turns like a hinge and says, now that I'm the ruler of this world, I'm going to ask you to rule 10 cities for me. This isn't a make-believe comment here. This is actually 10 cities. And Christ is linking something that is absolutely profound. What I do for Christ before I die or before he comes, determines what Christ asks me to do after he comes. Faithfulness is not doing the same thing over and over and over again. Faithfulness in this passage, if you're going to be a good interpreter of Scripture, faithfulness is defined as being very productive. You took one and you made ten because you proved to me in your lifetime, that I could count on you? <laughs> Rule 10 cities, literally. When Christ comes back again, he'll be ruling the world, and he will be delegating the rulership of cities to people who knew him and served him and were extremely productive for him. And the question you want to ask yourself is, are you living for that day? You see, when do you hear well done? You hear it right here. And what's the basis of hearing well done? It is, what did you do? You're not hearing well done for the character of Christ. You're not going to hear well done for the fruit of the Spirit. You're not going to hear well done because you're born again, because that's a gift that you had nothing to do with. You just believed. You're going to hear well done for one reason and one reason only. You achieved a lot through the power of the Spirit for Christ while you lived. That's what causes Christ to say, well done. Are we not dealing with a root issue here? Something that's deep. 
Most people do not see Jesus as a person who will hold us accountable for results. Jesus made up a story to say, I'm going to hold you very accountable for results. I told you to seek my kingdom first and to learn how to grow my kingdom through your life. So I'm linking something that Jesus Christ talked about. That is, my productivity for him while I'm alive determines what happened to me on the other side. Take a look at the next one. Number six is the five mina servant, his productivity and his reward. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. This verse changed my life a lot. Do you realize what Jesus didn't say to that man? He didn't say, well done. He didn't say, good servant. And he didn't give him ten cities. It's unlike the parable of the talents when it's according to your ability. This is, we're all the same. And I think what Christ was saying between the sentence was, you could have had ten. You could have had ten. But because you at least got five, you see the proportion. You got five you'll rule five cities. And when I saw that, it was at two o'clock in the morning, when I finally saw this years ago, and I asked myself the question, am I a 10 mina man? And I realized I wasn't. I'd always said it's God's responsibility. It's my job just to be faithful, which I was taught was just keep doing the same things. And if God wants to bless it, he'll bless it. And if he doesn't, that's up to him. Therefore, if it grows or not, it's not up to me. It's not my fault. I'm not responsible. He's responsible. And it doesn't look like he's doing much. Did you get that? It's called delegating up. When God delegated down. No, no, you do business. I'll be with you. But it's your responsibility to do the business. And if it's not growing, don't blame me. Ooh. Ooh. wait don't you dare blame christ for a failure on earth so i got so convicted because i realized he told me to do business <laughs> i thought he did the business and i just did my stuff <laughs> no no by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit it doesn't say that christ bears much fruit i have to bear the fruit and that night that night oh conviction just fell heavy because all of a sudden i felt responsible up to that point i didn't why not he's responsible i'm not responsible when you look up the definition of not responsible, it is irresponsible. That's what irresponsible means, not to be responsible. And when I felt the weight, he said to me, no, no, you, you do it. I'll be with you. I wrote a book for you. I gave you the spirit. I gave you the mind of Christ. What more do you need? The verse says, I can do all things through. We think that verse says, Christ can do all things. Uh -uh, I can. And it's until you understand personal productivity is 100% in your camp. It's not to do with the culture. It's not to do with the government. It's not to do with the economy. It's not to do with anything except you. And so I repented of not being a 10 mean a man that night. And I told my wife about that. I came back to walk through the Bible the next week and told my team, I'm not a 10 mean a man, and this organization isn't a 10, organiz 10 mean organization. Starting today, we're repenting and we're turning it around. And we did, by God's grace, but by a lot of hard work. Now, what about you? So, take a look at the next point. 
the one Mina servant. Oh, this is where most Christians live. Right here. And this is not going to be good news. Then another came saying, Master, your Mina, I have kept put away in a handkerchief. What is that? That's, that's this. <laughs> this. It's clean. <laughs> this is exactly what he did. Jesus, here it is. I've kept it in a handkerchief for you. Okay, now. 99% of all Christians around the world do not understand what I'm teaching you today. That you are responsible for your own productivity. We believe once we've come to meet Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have the gift of salvation, and we do. And that's where we stay. We don't understand. No, no. You've been created for good works. And you've been called to be extremely productive with your life. So the average person does not seek the kingdom of God first. They do not sacrifice very much. And the average church doesn't grow at all. And they believe this is what God wants. <laughs> what? It's not my will that any should perish, but it's my will that the church doesn't grow. We'll get into that later on today. So this person comes with the mina wrapped in a, in a cloth. And then he says this, For I feared you because you are an austere or a sober-minded person or a person who holds you accountable for results. You collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you didn't sow. Question, is that a true sentence? That's a very challenging thought. But wait, stick with me. This is a huge aha here. There weren't three people here. These are made up people. Jesus is making up each person. The person comes, he made this person up. And he made up what this person said to Jesus. I knew you're an austere and a person who holds us accountable. You're serious. And that you collect what you didn't earn. You reap what you didn't sow. Question, is that true about Jesus? The answer is, it absolutely is. That's the whole point of the parable. Because Jesus says, I'm giving you this. I'm not going to do this. You're going to do this. I want you to make money from my money. And I'm leaving. I want to reap where I didn't sow. I want to make money when I didn't earn it. I want you to earn it. I want my kingdom to grow, and I want you to make it grow. This is a true sentence. Let me prove to you it's true because of what Christ said in the next sentence. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. Watch this, you wicked servant. Whoa, does Christ hold this man accountable for results or what? You had one and you stayed at one? You're wicked. Yeah, it's not I did my best stuff. Wait, it's not I did my best. You cannot find Jesus asking anyone, did you try hard? No? Yeah, but wait. That's what we've made Jesus into, is a soft person who does not hold you accountable. And Jesus is saying, you, you misunderstand. When I came the first time, I came as the Lamb of God. I was meek. I was mild. When I come the second time, I'm not coming meek and mild. I'm coming with a rod of iron. I'm going to strike people down, and I'm holding people accountable. And I'm ruling the world with a rod of iron. You, you misunderstand. This was a role he had. This is the role he's going to have, and it's not the same. And he holds people accountable, and he holds me accountable, and he holds you accountable. And I want you to know this. It should put the fear of God in you. Because it put the fear of God in me to this day. Why? I have to answer to him. You read what Paul says. I'm scared to death of that day. Because my whole life is related to that day. 
then what did Jesus go on and say? Are you following me? Are you feeling the weight of it? It took me a year to get over this. Because all of a sudden when you realize up till then in my life, I just tried hard and worked a lot. I didn't pay attention to the results. I said, the results are yours. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 the results are yours. You do business till I come. And what did you do while I left? So as this goes on and this person, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man. Jesus is saying to us, I am that kind of person. Jesus didn't say, no, you lied. I'm not an austere person. Jesus is saying, no, I am one. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I could have collected it with interest? What did he really get to? He got to the real truth of the person who wasted his life. He was hoping Christ wouldn't come back again and it would be his. Because if he put it in the bank, he'd put it in his master's name and it wasn't his. That's why he hid it. That's why Christ is really a bit furious. If that was the truth about you, and you knew that I was like this, and you didn't even put it in the bank, you're wicked. Now, what is this really saying? I'm going to live my own life the way I want. And I don't want to sacrifice that much. And my life is busy. And I don't really want to serve Christ that much. And I don't want to learn the secrets of how to grow and grow and grow and grow. Well, what did Christ do? Because this is going to happen to people right here. This is going to happen a lot at the judgment here. This won't happen a little bit. Part number two, Jesus warns, double your mina or you will lose it. What? Yes, double or nothing. You have to double this or Christ will take it away from you. When? W watch this. After you're dead. The second coming. I'll prove this to you later on today. This happens here. And Christ takes it away from the person who had one because of the unfaithfulness. See, we've defined faithfulness as just working hard, preaching long, serving God a little bit, but not counting on the results. You'll not find Christ defining faithfulness that way. So Christ reveals what's going to happen, and it's not good news. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him. Oh, mercy. And give it to him who had ten minas. Everybody has a fit there. It says, but they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. What happens here? This will help you understand the seriousness of it. Jesus says, take it away from this one. He'll do nothing for me over here. He proved to be unfaithful here. That's where you... Keep your life, but you lose it. You have to lose your life to keep it. That's a whole other talk. But then what Jesus does is he doesn't give it to the person who has three minas or four minas or five minas. He skips all the way over and gives it to the one who has ten minas. And everybody else thinks it's socialistic in heaven. They do. They think it's all going to be the same in heaven. And my friends, you'll not find that in Scripture. And he gives it to the ten. I had a man come up to me, and he was really upset about what Jesus did. And I said, sir, do you have investments? Yes, I have investments in three accounts. I said, okay. Let's say at the end of the year, this account grew 2%. This one grew 5%. And this one grew 30%. What would you do the next year? <laughs> he said, well, that's easy. I would take the money out of here and I'd give it to the one here. 
You mean you gave it, take it away from the poor performer and you give it to the best performer? Yes. I said, that's exactly what Jesus does. <laughs> yeah, but those of you who are beginning to see this, you must understand this is how it's going to be. And Jesus' point is, if you only keep one, it's not going to be a happy day here. So, he takes it away, which encourages the person who is the most productive. Part three is a simple one. Jesus commands judgment on my enemies, but bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. That's going to happen at the second coming. Therefore, as we conclude this on part number four, I want to ask you a question. It's a question I opened up my own self to reveal that I found out that I wasn't a five mina or a ten mina person, and that began a major revolution in my life today. So my question to you is this. Are you one? And the church or business that you lead, is it productive? Is it doubling? Why, why did I compromise? And use the word double. That's the slowest. If you take one and you don't make another one, it take, it, Christ takes it away from you. How to grow ten times. That's the ten mean a person. This is the minimum. This is the minimum. So we're going to talk about that throughout the day. But until you come to grips with the fact of you are the one who's responsible. You cannot come to Christ and say, I want to be a ten mina, but you wouldn't let me. <laughs> you can be. But you have to learn the laws. You have to learn how to let the pen go so it falls. Christ does not evaluate us on how many hours we work. It's the results you generate. By this, my Father is glorified that you work 50 hours a week, 55 hours a week. I'm really faithful, 60 hours. Really. It's the results that you're dealing with. So how many of you, can I ask you that personal question, are saying to yourself, whoa, I think I'm getting it, and I need to reevaluate on how to become a 10 mean a person. How many of you are there? Let me see your hands. That I need to learn to become a ten mina person. How many of you are feeling the conviction of this? Oh! The seminaries of the world teach that quantity is irrelevant to God. Yes, they do. I've spoken in many of them. It's all about quality, not quantity. The commitments of the ten mina servants. Point number one is the ten mina servant, number one, reevaluates, reevaluates the level of current personal productivity. Point number two, the ten mina servant realizes, realizes full personal responsibility to multiply minas. A mina represents your life. You realize it. It's my responsibility. Point number three. The ten mina servant refocuses on achieving eternal results. Refocuses on achieving eternal results. Unders underscore the word results there. Point number four. The ten mina servant restrains, restrains from sinful and wasteful lifestyle. And number five. The Ten Mina Servant redoubles efforts to become a fully productive Ten Mina Servant. Coming up next, session questions. But first, enjoy these gifts from Teach Every Nation. Just visit the link below to obtain your free downloads. <laughs> 